All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it looks like we have actually exceeded the capacity for folks allowed on this webinar, which is both a good and bad problem. So there's lots of interest, but uh, we will be posting the webinar um, on the WEAT website. I'll send a link to all attendees after the webinar, and you can review it, and we'll also send it to everyone that registered. I want to thank you all for joining us for the WEAT webinar and new spill reporting rule, knowing when and how to use it. Please submit any questions as you have them using the question dialog box at the bottom half of your control panel. You should see a thumbnail picture of the question dialog box on your screen right now. We'll cover all questions during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Our first panelist is Macy Beecham. Macy has a Bachelor's of Science in Biology from the University of Texas at San Antonio and a Master's of Science in Wildlife Ecology from Texas State University. Ms. Beecham began work, began work as a contractor for the TCQ's Water Supply Division in October of 2008. She worked in various positions in the Water Supply Division, including taking on compliance on the newly introduced groundwater rule. In 2013, she moved to the Office of Compliance and Enforcement, working as a water liaison in the Program Support Section. Since this time, Ms. Beecham has worked with the Aggregate Production Operations, Stormwater, and Water Quality Programs. Next up, we'll have Nathan Vassar. Nathan is an attorney at Lloyd Gosling, Rochelle, and Townsend in Austin, Texas. His practice focuses on assisting clients with enforcement defense matters, regulatory compliance, water quality matters, and water resources development. Nathan helps communities facing Clean Water Act compliance issues and represents clients in civil litigation matters uh, before federal and state courts and administrative agencies. Nathan received his Bachelor of Arts at the University of Virginia and his Doctor of Jurisprudence from the University of Texas School of Law. Prior to the practice of law, Nathan worked in state politics as a legislative director for a state senator in Virginia. Susan Jablonski will also participate as a panelist during the Q&A session. Susan Jablonski is the area director for the Central Texas for Central Texas at the TCEQ. She oversees regional activities at the regional directors of the Central Texas area, identifying regional needs and developing plans to address those needs. She also manages statewide programs that support and provide reporting for all TCEQ regions. Susan is a professional engineer and a health physicist. She received her undergraduate degree in radiological health engineering administered by the Texas A&M University Nuclear Engineering Department and her graduate degree from the University of Texas at Austin in environmental engineering. Susan has extensive experience working with waste management, public policy, environmental and radiological monitoring, environmental engineering, waste characterization, and the management of disposal waste material. And we will also have Brad Castleberry on today's panel. Brad is a principal attorney with Lloyd Gosling, Rochelle, and Townsend here in Austin, Texas, and as well as the chair of the Compliance and Enforcement Practice Group and a member of the Water Practice Group. Brad represents clients on the many issues surrounding regulatory compliance, environmental permitting, and defense water law, as well as water supply planning, natural resources, water quality, and construction litigation. He's also established qualifications as a mediator and as a licensed professional engineer. Prior to joining Lloyd Gosling in 2002, Brad practiced engineering, assisting clients in the planning, design, and construction of water and wastewater and other municipal projects. Brad received his Doctor of Jurisprudence from the University of Texas School of Law, and he received and he recently served as an adjunct professor of water law at Texas Tech University School of Law. And lastly, I'm Julie Nargong, the Executive Director of Wheat and Taqua, and will be your webinar moderator today. And I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce the new reporting the new reporting rule and provide some background on why Wheat and Taqua members pushed for the passage of SB uh, 912, which created the new reporting standard. Wheat's mission is to preserve and enhance the water environment of Texas through common sense environmental regulation and policy. And to that end, we looked at the previous reporting standard for SSOs and believe that utilities operators and or regulators could benefit from some changes. As most of you know, the previous reporting requirements mandated by the Clean Water Act were that utilities verbally report a spill of any size to the TCEQ and EPA within 24 hours. A full written report was to be submitted within five days. As everyone knows, small spills that do not speak to the systemic collection system problems or operator errors will occur in the course of treatment. The new spill rule addresses this fact and allows the regulators to better identify which utilities need scrutiny versus those that have infrequent small spills that occur within the course of collection system maintenance and operation.
Now, take a look at these pictures. We looked at SSOs, and to the end of our mission, we realized that uh, this SSO pictured here does not equal in ramification scope or should reporting requirements equal this one, an accidental spill or discharge of 100 gallons or less. And that's really the background to this new rule. Uh, WEEPS members were looking for a common sense approach to address this issue. Now, one problem or several problems with, with the rule as it was previously stated is there's a reporting burden on both our utilities and our regulatory agencies. There's also an information management burden. When you're receiving um, uh, notices of spills, uh, those smaller and significant spills of uh, 1,000 gallons or less, with the same type of paperwork and documentation needed to um, notify those of spills of 1,000 gallons or more, or even 250,000 gallons, there's, there's an information management problem. And lastly, there's also the federal perspective, which Nathan Basser will dive in a bit deeper to. But there's a, unfortunately, there's, there's a sense of a um, beauty contest where one city's report card is compared against another city's report card, and spills are treated equally so that one spill, that of 1,000 gallons or less, will appear to be the same in a race or the EPA's eyes as a spill of 250,000 gallons or more. So the level of reporting has the potential also to mislead the public into thinking that a serious public health and safety issue exists every time an SSO is reported. So the solution, Wheat and TOCWA members sought to establish a distinction between the reporting requirements of unauthorized discharges and spills. Um, we wanted to establish this distinction in both the characterization and the way the reporting um, was mandated. And the method was uh, to see uh, Senate Bill 912 be drafted and sponsored by Senator Eltif. And the exact language of that you can read, it's relating to volume-based exemption from reporting requirements for certain accidental discharges or spills from wastewater facilities. And uh, this bill does establish that minimum reportable volume for SSOs and provides relief for wastewater utilities from the reporting burden and provides a more meaningful um, information to the public and regulatory agencies. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Macy Beecham, who will now give you kind of the nuts and bolts of reporting, how to use the form, and the criteria by which um, you can report those smaller, less significant spills. Now, just to give a little background on the rule, WEEP's mission is to preserve and enhance the water environment through Texas through common sense environmental regulation and policy. And to this end, we took a look at uh, the reporting requirements for large spills and uh, those smaller spills and saw that there was a need to create a distinction between those two types of SSOs. This SSO here is not like this SSO here. Um, yet the reporting standards and the paperwork required for both are uh, previous to the new rule were the same. So uh, this was something that uh, Wheat and Taqua members um, thought that we needed to change for our utilities and our members here in Texas as well as our regulatory agency. Now the problem is, is uh, by having those smaller, less significant spills that don't speak to a systemic problem with the collection system and are likely the results of just everyday operation of that system, by having those uh, meet the same standard as the large spills of uh, over a thousand gallons, even those that reach 250,000 gallons, this creates a reporting burden, both for our utilities and for our TCEQ, our regulatory agency. It also creates an information management burden. When you receive the same documentation for insignificant spills as you do for the large spills, it's, it's difficult to see the big picture um, when all of this information coming in, all of the reports look the same. 
and we also took a look at the federal perspective. Um, often uh, cities are compared to other cities and it becomes a beauty contest. So if you do have, uh, if you do follow the reporting standard, the previous reporting standard for those in Texas um, mandated by the Clean Water Act, if you report every drop as it happens verbally within 24 hours and submit your written report within five days of the spill, uh, those smaller and significant spills um, are comparatively, in the eyes of the EPA, the same as those larger spills. And so by creating a reporting threshold that allows for a cumulative reporting summary at the end of each month, we've uh, sought to fix that um, question of optics or that issue whereby um, one city is seen similar to another city even though the spills are not the same. And the solution was to create, as I said before, that distinction in reporting. So uh, to change both the requirements and the characterization of the small spills versus those large spills. And the method that we did that by was uh, uh, putting strong support behind Senator Kevin L. Tice's um, bill, Senate Bill 912. And with that, I will pass it along to Macy Beecham, who will cover the nuts and bolts and the technical aspect of the new, new spill reporting rule. Good afternoon. Um, as Julie said, uh, Senate Bill 912 was passed during the 84th legislative session and amends Texas Water Code Section 26.039. Um, it allows some entities to report spills that meet specific requirements to report it as a monthly summary instead of within 24 hours. procedures for formatting and submitting the monthly summary. For rulemaking, we updated Section 305, Chapter F of the Texas Administrative Code, which covers permitting characteristics and conditions. And we added a new section to um, Section 327 of the Texas Administrative Code to address unpermit unpermitted facilities. Uh, the uh, rule was adopted May 11th and, the, and became effective June 2nd of this year. To be eligible to report any accidental discharge or spill monthly, it must meet all of the following. It must occur at a waste operated by a local government. It must be less than, um, it must be a thousand gallons or less. It cannot be associated with another simultaneous accidental discharge or spill. It must be controlled or removed before entering water in the, of the state or adversely affecting a public or private source of drinking water. It cannot endanger human health or the environment and cannot otherwise be subject to local regulatory control and reporting requirements. Uh, we made updates to regulatory guidance 395, which is the guidance for unauthorized discharges and SSOs. This, um, the new version is currently on the website, and I have a link here. And the main changes to the RG were just to add the new requirements. Um, we did a little. All the 24-hour notices stay the same, um, but we've added some new language um, for the monthly written notification to TCEQ. Um, updates were made to the current non-compliance form. The form is um, still the same as it was before. We have just added um, some 
changes to the instruction portion of the form. Um, those changes are still with our agency communication, but that should be available on the website soon. We created a monthly submission form, that's TCQ form 20756, and you can get through that to that through the TCQ homepage. I will see if I can get to the homepage and show you where the form section is. Over here on the left side of the homepage form, you can search either keyword like Bill, or you can search the form number, which is 20756. And that is what the, the form looks like. Um, I, have a, I have an example form. Um, You'll uh, submit, uh, you'll mark whether you are a permittee or subscriber. Um, you'll enter your regulated entity name and number. If you don't know this, you should contact the regional office. Um, you'll enter your permit number and EPA ID if you are a permitted facility. Otherwise, if you're a subscriber, you'll leave that blank. You'll enter your TCEQ region and county. Um, For the form itself, the monthly uh, submission, each submission you'll need to put the start date and start date and time and end date and time for each film and use the, um, your best estimate of those dates and times. Um, the volume, the location, the cause, um, steps taken to um, prevent occurrences, and a description of the film. And you'll also need to um, include your um, method for, uh, for the estimated volume calculation. One requirement on the form is the standard method for estimating the volume. Four standard methods were included in the new rules. Determining um, which method is appropriate to estimate your spill and volume. Determine which method is appropriate to estimate your spill volume and include it on the form. The first method is visual estimate, which is better for small spills. Uh, you will visualize how many five gallon buckets or 55 gallon barrels could contain the spill and multiply that by either five or 55. Second method is measured volume. Calculate the area containing the spill in feet and measure the depth in several locations to get an average in feet. Then multiply the area, the depth, and multiply uh, by 7.5, which is the conversion factor from cubic feet to gallon. And there is a guidance document um, provided by um, Orange County, California, which is available on the web that includes examples of these um, calculations and other um, calculations. And then the third option is to simply uh, multiply duration of the spill times the flow rate if both are known. And we also included a fourth other method which would include any method that is consistent with standard industry practices and includes procedures to identify duration, flow rate, depth, affected area, and total quality. Um, another helpful guidance comes from the Southern California Alliance of Publicly Owned Treatment Works and also can be found online. It also includes more information um, It's a PowerPoint presentation and includes uh, other methods like
connection counting and give them some pictorial references. Give them pictorial references like overflowing sewer manholes. And then on the horizon is the uh, new federal e reporting rule, which went into effect December 25th, 21st, 2015. There's two phases of the, this rule. Um, the purpose is to replace paper based permitting and compliance monitoring with electronic reporting. Um, phase two of the rule goes into effect December 21st, 2020, and includes um, SSOs and bypass events. So we are working on. Um, coming up with a way to report the accidental discharges and spills electronically. So um, that should take the place of those paper forms within the next two or three years. And with that, there is my contact information. And I'm going to turn it back over to Julie. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nathan Vassar, and I um, <clears throat> want to talk about just some of the bigger overarching policy issues um, that communities across Texas, really across the country, are facing. But uh, in the, the context of Senate Bill 912 and the, uh, the new reporting regime, you know, the message that we consistently tell our clients is use it. Use this uh, reporting uh, regime, and, and really, the importance here is, as Julie mentioned, and uh, I know it's been important to the WEAT membership, is staying off of the radar and staying out of enforcement. You know, it's, um, you know, it's been a challenge, I think, when you look across uh, the EPA regions across the country, uh, when you look at the way that different states treat uh, what is an SSO, what is an unauthorized discharge, versus what is just a spill, there have been some inconsistencies. And um, for a number of communities across Texas, uh, the what some have called a very Boy Scout-like reporting practice has landed some communities on an enforcement uh, radar from EPA. And so I want to talk a little bit about that uh, this afternoon. And uh, just we'll also discuss some of the general uh, tips and strategies to avoid enforcement uh, but in any event, I did just want to you know, just emphasize: use this reporting regime. A lot of uh, a lot of utilities have uh, practices where even the smaller spills continue to get reported as SSOs. Uh, recognize that has changing the approach does come with a um, an IT component, a uh, practice component. We send our five days in, we send our 24-hour reporting in, but Segregating out what are these de minimis spills uh, can be helpful. Yeah, they still get reported. The agency sees them, uh, EPA will see them, but they're treated uh, differently. And um, so, in any event, our core message from the outset is you know, use this 30 day reporting uh, form and, um, and go ahead and segregate what are SSOs versus what are, uh, what are de minimis spills. So I mentioned that uh, we're going to, you know, there is a bigger EPA focus on, uh, on wastewater and stormwater uh, pollution across the country. Recently, EPA renewed its three-year enforcement initiative uh, that <clears throat> focuses on keeping polluted wastewater and, and stormwater out of our nation's waters. And so as a result, you see a renewed focus from EPA. You see on, on a chart that I provided here, uh, EPA has worked through a number of communities, both separate system and uh, combined system, most, mostly in Texas, we have separate systems as far as enforcement. And so um, you know, the uh, metric that EPA had been using for a number of years had been, are you a 10 MGD or greater uh, average daily discharge? Uh, what we've seen here in Texas has been, and really across the country, has been uh, smaller utilities, um, a lot of satellite utilities, uh, have been 
uh, investigated and in some cases uh, enforced against. Uh, so in any event, that's a trend that, that we're seeing and it's not inconsistent with uh, EPA's effort to continue uh, looking at communities, seeing what is their compliance uh, rate, what is the, uh, ultimately what is the SSOs per 100 miles per year. Uh, some of you are familiar with, with this, but uh, the unspoken uh, the unspoken background is you want to see three to four SSOs per 100 miles per year. Uh, EPA takes the approach that you know any SSO is a violation of the Clean Water Act and that all SSOs should be eliminated. But for purposes of compliance planning, for purposes of focusing on your infrastructure uh, investments, you know aiming at or knowing EPA's goal of three to four per 100 miles per year. Uh, is is a worthwhile benchmark as as you're looking to reduce overflows. Um, you know, I mentioned that you know, there are a number of of consent decrees, both that target uh, that, that target wastewater infrastructure, but also uh, stormwater infrastructure, and we we expect to see that uh, to increase. Um, there's been generally a move away from administrative orders at EPA uh, and more toward a, a shift toward consent decrees, but uh, at least through 2019, which is the next cycle of um, enforcement initiatives, we expect that to continue. Um, another item I want to talk about here is next generation compliance. Uh, this is an effort by EPA to really focus on uh, transparency and focus on information data sharing, making it uh, more available, making it readily available online. Uh, and elsewhere, there are other components to it, including uh, some third-party uh, review and enforcement scenarios. But um, you know, Macy discussed the e-reporting rule. Certainly, you know, by the end of this year, you know, your uh, all TPDS permittees will be impacted by that. Um, you know, in the second phase, you'll see you know a broader impact. But you know, <clears throat> part of the goal that you see from uh, the federal regulators is let's get more information uh, out there, make it available, and so utilities that are you know, in compliance or in some cases uh, who aren't um, need to be aware that you know, this this effort for greater transparency, the effort for uh, you know, e-reporting, not just spills but you know, samples, uh, you know, data collection, really any requirement under a permit or enforcement order. Uh, would be shared and made made openly available, and of course that has consequences uh, as well, just in the enforcement arena. Um, you know, we'll talk about some some tools that are available. Folks on this call are certainly familiar with uh, developing a CMOM if you don't already have one, conducting a self audit, seeing where you are uh, with respect to uh, the benchmarks that are out there. Um, you know, EPA has uh, pitched an approach of Integrated planning, looking at looking at compliance obligations across your wastewater and in some cases stormwater uh, infrastructure. So it's um, and certainly you know it, on this call we certainly need to make sure that we point out using this reporting approach is critical in order to um, in order to uh, ideally stay off of the radar and stay out of enforcement. As we shift to the next slide, I do want to point out one thing that we see from time to time is, and this goes along with the Boy Scout reporting uh, that's very common, is over-reporting or reporting when you're not even required to uh, report under state or federal law. And um, what I'm talking about is spills that occur, basement backups that are not caused by utilities infrastructure. So here you know, we've got a uh, little illustration showing private sewer lateral Depending on the city, sometimes the city's infrastructure ends uh, at the property line. Sometimes um, it's around the cleanout. But you know, the point is, there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, spills that occur, basement backups that occur due to backups in private laterals. Um, you know, some communities are are smart to track that. Certainly, communities are going to get the call uh, from you know, the affected resident, but it's smart just to know if you have an SSO that is, you know, because if there's an SSO that is re uh, realized inside of a home or private residence um, that was caused by a city main backup, that's reportable. If it's caused by a private lateral backup and it's on the private side, 
you know, that's not an SSO. Um, so it's it's an important distinction, but uh, it's one that's often overlooked, and sometimes communities will find themselves again on the bad side of the of the report card because of um, over-reporting or reporting when it's not necessary to be reported. And we talked about some of the tools that are available, and this is, this is something that uh, we've helped a number of communities out with, is you know, just developing a, um, a robust uh, set of documents that document your practices, document practices that, that work um, and that capture the training efforts that you have with, with your employees. Um, you know, this is this is important just as a general best practice, but it's also important. You know, should I, a community face enforcement from uh, from TCEQ or EPA uh, to be able to point out, hey, this is our process, and this is uh, this is the process that we're following. We we'll go to the final slide here. Um, as I mentioned, there's there's a nationwide there's a nationwide emphasis on SSOs and um, and also you know, on MS4 systems. Okay, we're on the right right one here. Um, and so Texas has certainly started to come within uh, EPA's focus on a number of uh, in a number of communities across the, the state. At least five communities have been either under enforcement from EPA or under the threat of enforcement, um, and there are, there are more and more. Uh, so, you know, punchline, as we stated earlier, is stay off the radar. Uh, comply with uh, comply with the reporting requirements. Use the Senate Bill 912 approach as an opportunity, uh, as an opportunity to you know, both report in a way that's consistent now with state law uh, as it's been revised, and also as an opportunity to uh, take a look at you know, what are our compliance trends, what are the ways that we can improve uh, improve our practices to ideally stay stay out of the enforcement. Um, stay out of the enforcement uh, realm. So with that, I think we have some questions, and uh, I'll turn it back over to Julie and the panel, and we can look to answer what folks want to talk about. All right. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you, Macy. And once again, we do have uh, Susan Jablonski and Brad Castleberry here to answer questions as well. We've had a few float in. If you have any others, please submit them using your question dialog box. Um, you can see the image of that at the bottom of the screen. There's a thumbnail image. And I do want to remind everyone that the slides as well as the complete webinar will be accessed, will be um, you can access it on wheat.org slash newspillrulewebinar.shtml. We'll send that URL out to everyone after the webinar as well. Now, for the first question, um, and I'm going to pose this to the group, and you guys just uh, pipe in when you have an answer. Uh, is, is this new rule um, only for municipal wastewater plants, or does it cover industrial facilities too? Well, it, it, it only covers um, the uh, wastewater plants, and it doesn't cover industrial. Um, and, and that was specifically in the legislation. And so the rules mirror the limitations of, of who can use the monthly reporting. Thanks, Susan. And Macy, this question is for you, although anyone can jump in and, and answer as well. Would a federal facility be qualified for this reporting? Um, it has to be owned or operated by a local government, so it wouldn't fall under it. Can I just say, the intent of that, you know, we don't, we didn't go into this thinking that industrial facilities, I'm sorry, this is Brad Castleberry, we didn't go into this thinking that industrial facilities would have collection systems. So the focus here is not about the treatment units, um, it's more about the collection systems, and, and those are typically owned by uh, political subdivisions, and so that's that was the focus of the legislation was to deal with the SSOs and the collection system because, as Nathan mentioned, that's the metric that EPA uses for whether you're a good or a bad uh, manager of your system. 
And the next question, thank you, Brad. Um, is there a TCEQ guidance document for estimating discharges? We don't have a guidance document currently. Um, the two that I mentioned in the presentation, the one from Southern California and the Orange County, um, have very good information, but we don't have a TCEQ specific one. So we do have um, a regulatory guidance document, which Macy put up, which is Regulatory Guide RG395, that kind of work, walks through the submission, but it doesn't lay out a prescribed methodology that, that we're endorsing. The rule allows four different methodologies, and any of those are acceptable. Um, we've referenced two of the California documents as, as something that we reviewed and was submitted to us as part of the stakeholder discussion um, prior to the rulemaking. So, you know, we're looking for a standard practice that you can document, and we're not prescribing a specific process. We're giving you some options in, in doing that. And, and I think there's a, there's a lot of good examples out there. May do a couple. Thanks, Susan. And we will post the link that Macy um, referenced in her presentation on the WEED website on that same page on the URL that you see at the bottom of your page. So you can access all of these documents, including the presentations and webinar itself at that URL. And uh, next question. Um, and this is a pretty, pretty common one. Uh, you might stump our panel of experts. Would an SSO on a customer or homeowner's uh, property perhaps their lateral line, be considered a reportable incident that would need to be reported to the TCEQ? So it depends on, this is Nathan, uh, really depends on where the problem is caused. Is it caused by a backup on the you know, city or utility main that ultimately results in an overflow in the, uh, you know, on the private side of things? In that case, it would need to be reported because it's an operation and maintenance issue on the city infrastructure. If, on the other hand, uh, you know, there's an investigation, you look, you, you uh, uh, TV it, you see, well, there really wasn't an issue on the city side of things, but there's a collapsed lateral, for example, and it was on the private side, then that would not uh, be an issue for, uh, that would have to be reported. It, it really, the trigger and the way to think about it is, was the utilities infrastructure at fault? Was, there, it, was it a defect or a fault in the utility on the utility side of things, or did the defect happen on the uh, private side? And sometimes it's hard to tell. Um, but you know that's that's generally the the divide that we'd recommend and, uh, using. And um, I don't know if others have thoughts on that as well. Nathan, I think we'd agree at TCQ with that assessment. And I think you know sometimes we hear reporting and people will be cautious up front and then come back and let us know that they've determined that it wasn't sourced in a municipality and then that will be taken off the list. I think the beauty of the monthly reporting is it allows you some time to figure that out before you have to give the information. So hopefully that in, in the past where you might have come to us in, in an abundance of caution and reported it and then found out it wasn't. Um, part of municipality here, you would have some time to be able to make that assessment prior to reporting. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks, Susan. All right, next question. Um, if a spill happens in, a, in the municipal facility, so the facility itself, and does not discharge to public streets, would this still be a reportable offense, a reportable spill? Again, that's um, <clears throat> typically, those aren't reported if it's in the plant site itself. Um, you know, it would that wouldn't be a discharge if it was in the facility itself and it was managed in the facility itself. And so, you know, if it was, and, and so we would normally not see that. Those aren't the kinds of SSOs that are reported to the agency. It the only time I think that would change is if you know you lost control of it on a plant site and it got onto property grounds near the boundary. Um, I, I don't remember seeing those, Macy. I, I, you know, I don't think that's the case. I think generally when you'll have an issue on a plant site, you're able to control it, and that's not reported to the TCQ. Great. Thank you. And Nathan, this question is for you or Brad. Um, so is the EPA looking for cities that don't report something 
um, every month. So I think what the what the question is speaking to is if uh, a city is not submitting the monthly reporting document, um, will that trigger a closer look from the EPA? I think as a matter of, of practice, it could uh, result in an in increased attention. Um, you know, the, the reality is EPA will be able to see the compliance history and you know, whether it's a uh, thousand gallons or greater or these smaller spills. Um, you know, the point I wanted to, I was making earlier was that if you are still treating, even in the post SB 912 world, if you're still treating de minimis spills you know, under a thousand gallons um, as SSOs, then EPA is going to get those on a more regular basis and your report card looks differently as opposed to uh, you have you know X number of you know small spills that get reported once every 30 days and then you have a different set of numbers for you know your larger volume uh, spills and so EPA looks at both quantity um, of you know of the spills you have as well as the volume um, and so you, you don't you also don't want to have a bunch of high volume spills either. But uh, certainly, you know, if you have, you know, if you can segregate them out, it's it's all for the better. But you know, what EPA is looking at, you know, just as DCEQ does, is, is compliance history. Um, and you know, this is an opportunity. Really, it's an opportunity for utilities to tell their story about here here are our SSOs, here are true violations, and over here are other. Uh, events, which you know, may be just because there's there's work done, you know, while you're slip lining a pipe, and you know some uh, escapes, some sewage escapes during that, and it was contained. Uh, so it's just really drawing a line between what are what are violations in the truest sense, that likely to have environmental harm or public health impacts on the one hand, and what are de minimis spills that you know there's a different story to tell for those. Thank you, Nathan. Now, th this next question um, can get us kind of into the weeds, but it's an interesting one. Um, are utilities at fault with all the flushable wipes that are being flushed in the system? So I think the, the questioner is, is pointing to the issue of, of flushable wipes wreaking havoc on collection systems and then causing SSOs. Is that, uh, it's pretty theoretical, but is that the utility's fault? Well, uh, this is Brad. Um, unfortunately, the Clean Water Act has a strict liability standard, and it's not whether <clears throat> somebody uh, cut into your line. It's not whether you know a, con a third-party contractor broke through your line. It's not whether uh, people are putting rocks in manholes. Um, unfortunately, it's the, the compliance is upon uh, the permittee, and so um, obviously that's why one component of a CMOM program involves fat soils and grease management, which could arguably entail education with respect to flushable wipes. Um, so I would say, unfortunately, the, the legal burden is upon the utility to manage the collection system. And part of that management includes education, not only for uh, you know all the Mexican food restaurants out there with grease traps, but also for the public. Um, and this is a bigger industry-wide issue, as we all know, um, so that folks try to limit the use of flushable wipes, or at least uh, use those that are truly biodegradable. Thanks, Brad. That was uh, much more succinct than I thought that we would that we would get on that question. Um, next question. This is also a good one. Are SSO estimating techniques included in uh, training materials? So those provided by TCQ, TEKS, or TWA. So again, I don't think the estimation is something that TCQ is prescribing for you, but we are pointing you to some sources of, of estimation that we think are acceptable and will meet the rule um, for documentation. As far as other things that, that might be available to them, I don't know if y'all are pointing to any documents. Um, not specifically. Uh, we will distribute um, the four different ways to estimate or suggested um, estimation techniques written into this new rule. Um, we'll post those on the website on the URL below and then also send these around to all the attendees on this webinar. Um, and as Macy pointed out in her presentation, uh, 
there is uh, one technique that is um, kind of a combination of several and allows you to pull from um, existing industry standards to estimate the spill volume. All right, next question. Um, how does the TCQ share reporting with the EPA and how often? So I, I'm going to put a caveat on that. Um, how do you do it? Uh, how did you do it under the previous reporting standard and now how are you doing it under this new reporting standard? Um, as, as they come into the um, regional areas, they are put in seeds and seeds um, flows to ISIS. So Want to define those? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, for for, for, for the, the um, federal database, which they call ISCS, um, and that um, feeds into ECHO, which is available to the public. Um, but as soon as it um, is put into seeds, it, it can be available. So there's a ECHO. data entry. Um, um, on TCQ side, for those that are coming in fax or hard copy or whatever, they're coming into the agency, and then um, that goes into our data system that then flows automatically into the federal data system as part of our requirements. Um, and so there's a dashboard that can be accessed, and that information can be accessed, not on our website necessarily, but on each date, pretty, pretty soon after many of the events. Um, and, and Macy spoke to the e-reporting requirements. When those take place, you're going to go on a portal yourself, enter that information, and it will flow automatically to the federal system. And that's what they're requiring states to do. Great, thank you. I was going to follow up with with that question, but thanks for covering that, Susan, and thanks for covering it in your presentation, Macy. Um, all right, a couple more questions, and we have about five more minutes. Uh, if we wanted to access reported SSO data, i.e. volume, causes, location, et cetera, for an entire region, what's the best way to access that information? Um, as I mentioned, the TCQ doesn't have, we are not displaying that information in that way. Um, you could go on and, and get information from EPA, but regionally I think that you'd have to designate facilities to be able to get that information. From EPA, um, there. You, if this is something that, that you desire, we could run a report here um, that would be under Open Records um, and would have a you know data charge associated with it. But if it's something that you needed, um, you could make that request through the agency. We would do a data run um, and write code to be able to pull that information. But that would be the only way to get it at this point. There's not a display. Um, in that fashion available. Great, thank you. And Nathan, this question is, is directed to you. You spoke to um, kind of a window of SSOs per 100 mile of pipe per year um, that really raised the kind of uh, red flags for the EPA. What was that um, or how many SSOs are sure. we looking at? Yeah, the uh the target that EPA has been using, and um, it's somewhat changing as we speak even, has been three to four SSOs per 100 miles per year. And with that, they'd like, you to, they'd like to see utilities at or below that mark. Now, um, when you look at enforcement settlements that have been reached, uh, you know, you'll certainly recognize a trend of you know, provisions where the community must, quote unquote, eliminate SSOs. Um, in fact, you're seeing this a little bit uh, of a shift even in the CSO context uh, where it used to be that communities could rely on what was called a presumptive approach for compliance where you had 85% capture and, and uh, you had reduced, uh, you had demonstrated certain uh, performance uh, after implementing some infrastructure upgrades and, uh, and work, then you would be presumed to be in compliant with the act. And so, um, you know, the three to four for 100 miles per year is certainly a benchmark that folks should think about, um, but also be aware that, you know, look, from a federal perspective, the outright elimination, however difficult or uh, unwieldy that may be, is the new expectation. And um, so in any event, that's the, that's the benchmark. And that's the benchmark regardless of uh, volume. 
So EPA also doesn't like to see high volume uh, spills, but um, they really focus on the quantity. Great, thank you. And this next question uh, is submitted for Susan. It's, can the public request an ISIS report or must they go through ECHO? If you're looking specifically what's flowing to ISIS, um, that would be, that's EPA's platform of how they receive the information. And so we can't do a query in their um, data system and provide that to you from, from the back end. I mean, we, we have the raw data that flows into the system. So if you're looking for an ISIS output um, in the ECHO system, that would be an EPA request, not a TCQ request. Great, thank you. And another question here, if, see if I can read between the lines here. If residents report an SSO to the TCEQ and the municipality is not aware of that SSO until the TCEQ informs them, then the municipality goes to the site and still can't find a spill when they arrive, are they required to report it as an SSO? So I think the questioner is saying that uh, a citizen reported an SSO, but the municipality is unable to find, detect, or um, calculate the volume of that said SSO. Are they still required to report something that they can't see? No, um, but a complaint, we would call that a complaint coming into the agency. There would be follow-up from TCQ, and we'd be initiating likely an investigation ourselves and follow-up associated with it. And so if nothing could be tracked down of what was being reported, we would close that incident. Um, but, you know, that would be something now we're involved in that process, too, at the point that the complaint comes into our door. But if nothing's found, there'd be nothing to report. Again, it might be the situation that Nathan was talking about that might be more a property owner issue. That does happen, and those do get reported to the agency um, with some frequency of issues that are on the homeowner side of the of the line that they're they're reporting to us, and um, we we do as much education as we can about what the homeowner is responsible for versus their provider. And last question that also uh, speaks to um, flow that's witnessed and how you can calculate volume. If if you uh, if the municipality drives out onto the scene of an SSO and uh, sees um, a specific type of SSO, calculates the volume based on one of those calculate calculation methods suggested, are they required to add on what they think? the SSO would have been had they calculated it from the very beginning of the SSO? So part of the requirement of the monthly form as well as the 24-hour form is that you make an estimate of when it started, both date and time, and that should be part of the calculation. If you are aware that it occurred and it's been occurring since some reported time and you're making an estimate at this time, yes, you should include in that calculation the estimate from the time that you believe it began or when someone became aware of it. So if, if you have knowledge of that starting time, yes, that should be included in your calculation. Mm -hmm. And do you base that on the current flow that you've estimated? If that's how you're, you're planning to, um, and, and you have confidence that you understand that the flow has been you know, consistent. consistent through that time period, that would be an acceptable method to use. Okay. And Macy and Susan, have you all seen these one-page one pager forms come in? And if you have, are you able to speak to any of the common issues or problems that you've seen or anything that you uh, might want to tell our attendees how to do better or any common questions they might have? Um, we have seen a couple of them come in. Um, I have been made aware of a couple issues where People are using the monthly summary for larger spills over a thousand gallons and they're sending them in the next month. So we just want to make sure that people are use, still using the old uh, 00501 form for the 24 hour spills but, still, but don't meet the, 24, the monthly re reporting requirement. So that would be our caution <laughs> of, of folks because then you would be in violation. 
for meeting the 24-hour requirement if you waited 30 days to submit that report. Mm -hmm. All right, well, um, one last question. This is a good one to close out on because it speaks to kind of the, the very heart of this. Uh, Nathan, can you please clarify the definition of an SSO versus a de minimis spill? So in the context of, our, of, our, of this webinar and the new rule, please clarify. Yeah, so uh, an SSO would be uh, an SSO that's above the threshold that we've talked about here uh, that Senate Bill, the 1,000-gallon threshold. Um, and so a spill would be uh, less than that. So um, you know, just for a broader discussion briefly, I'll, I'll note that um, you know, there's a line of, of thinking that really an SSO should only be when, an S when the spill reaches jurisdictional waters, but uh, EPA, and, and I think, um, I don't want to speak for TCEQ, but you know, there's a uh, standard permit language that speaks to properly operating and maintaining your collection system. So even dry land, um, you know, dry land incidences can, uh, can count toward that. But uh, for our purposes, you know, we'd say SSO is, is you know, at or above that threshold, 1,000 gallons, and uh, spill would be that below that, that amount. Great. Thank you so much, Nathan. Um, and uh, thank you to all of our attendees. I want to give uh, Nathan, Brad, Macy, and Susan um, one last minute to touch on anything they want to they want to make a comment on. No? Brad's shaking his head. All right. Well, that brings us to the close of our webinar. Um, thank you again for attending. And once again, the webinar in its entirety can be reviewed at www.wheat.org slash new spill rule webinar shtml. We'll also have the individual presentation slides as well as all of the PDF attachments that Macy referenced in her presentation. Thank you so much and looking forward to the next time.